Good morning, listeners of Hot Topic and Fresh News. Today is the 24th of December, 2023. And as always, we're here to bring you the latest news. In a perplexing case that has spanned more than 40 years, doubts still linger about the true identity of Mary Day, a 13-year-old girl who mysteriously vanished from her seaside California home back in 1981. Despite the case being officially closed after a woman claiming to be Mary Day was found alive in 2003, skeptics, including former detectives, argue that the woman could be an imposter. Now, even after Mary's supposed death, the controversy continues as discussions about the authenticity of her identity surface, breaking the tranquility of this holiday season. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into this mystery, unraveling the enigmatic disappearance and reappearance of Mary Day. Welcome back to our regular listeners and a warm hello to our new ones. I'm your host, Emily Norma, and as always, I'm joined by the insightful David. We're here on Hot Topic and Fresh News, your daily dose of the most pressing news stories, hot off the press. Good to be here, Emily. Looks like we've got some real head scratchers in the news today. Indeed, David. Today, we're taking a deep dive into a puzzling case that has spanned over four decades. It's a real life mystery right out of a suspense novel. Stick with us because you won't believe what we're about to disclose. Can't wait, Emily. These real life mysteries always seem to have the most unpredictable twists. They certainly do, David. Before we unravel this mind boggling story, Here's a gentle reminder to our listeners. Your support goes a long way in helping us bring these stories to you. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, enable notifications, and leave your thoughts in the comments section. And if you enjoy listening to us as much as we enjoy bringing these stories to you, please share with your friends and families. So without any further ado, let's delve into our story of the day. Hot off the press. So we're talking about a 13-year-old girl who vanished with no record of her parents reporting her missing. That's incredibly odd, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, former Seaside Police Chief Steve Sircone admitted he couldn't recall another instance where parents hadn't reported their child missing. It's an unsettling case, that's for sure. And what happened when Sherry Calgaro, Mary's sister, reported her missing as an adult? Once Sherry reported Mary missing, the police believed she was murdered. It's a tragic thought, but the lack of evidence of Mary's existence as an adult led them to that conclusion. And yet this story takes a baffling turn, doesn't it? Let's delve into that. Indeed it does. Although the police believed Mary to be dead, a woman claiming to be Mary emerged years later, causing quite a stir in the investigation and puzzling everyone involved. I've never really pondered the consequences of a scenario like this. It's certainly a noteworthy point to reflect upon. Can you provide more insight into this? When someone who was assumed dead reappears, it sends shockwaves through everyone involved. Not just on an emotional level for the family and friends, but it can completely upheave an ongoing investigation, turning it on its head. It's a rare occurrence, but when it happens, it leaves a lasting impact. So Sherry Calgaro, Mary's sister, was the one who ultimately got the authorities on the case. Can you tell us more about their childhood? The Day sisters, Mary, Kathy, and Sherry, had a troubled childhood. Their mother couldn't take care of them, resulting in them being in and out of foster care. Sherry was adopted by her foster family, while Mary and Kathy returned to their mother Charlotte, who by then was married to William Hewell, a soldier. Interesting. And what more can you tell us about their lifestyle after they returned to their mother? The family moved frequently from base to base due to Houle's military career. Unfortunately, there were reports of physical abuse from Mary's stepfather. And at one point, Children's Protective Services took custody of Mary, but she was eventually returned to the family. That's really unfortunate. This just underscores how vital strong protective services are and how their failure can lead to dire consequences. Absolutely, the system did fail Mary in this case. When she disappeared, the family was living in Seaside, a military town where break to. Sorry to interrupt, but it's astounding to think that Mary's disappearance went unnoticed for so long. 
Even the neighbors barely recalled the family, let alone Mary. It's a sobering reminder of how easily someone can slip through the cracks. Indeed, it highlights the importance of community vigilance and attentiveness. It's a truly heartbreaking case. So it seems that Mary had never been enrolled in school and her parents didn't inform anyone about her disappearance. Was there any particular reason for this? Well, yes, it appears they had at least one incentive. Mary's birth father had died in an accident and she was receiving government checks. Her parents were cashing in these checks, providing a motive to keep her disappearance under wraps. That's incredibly disturbing. And what happened when Detective Bertena visited Mary's last known whereabouts with her sister Kathy? Kathy, then 11 years old, vividly recalls the day she last saw Mary. Their stepfather had accused Mary of poisoning their sick dog. And according to Kathy, a violent altercation followed. That's horrifying. It's clear this case is far more complex than it initially seemed. Did Kathy share anything else? Kathy did mention that after Mary disappeared, their parents forbade them to play in a certain area of the backyard. This led detectives to suspect they might be dealing with something far more sinister than just a runaway teen. It's like the plot of a mystery novel, isn't it? Only it's real life, which makes it all the more chilling. Absolutely. The case indeed took another dark turn when a team of cadaver dogs were brought in and they detected something near a tree in the backyard. The mystery continues to thicken. I'm on the edge of my seat here. So they started to dig and found a shoe. It must have been a heart-wrenching moment. Absolutely, it was a very tense moment. They were expecting to uncover a body, but surprisingly they found no remains, even though the cadaver dogs were sure of it. That's baffling. It raises so many questions. Where was the body moved? Who moved it? This case just keeps twisting and turning. It's a real-life crime mystery. As the investigation moved forward, the spotlight turned to the parents, who were identified as suspects. I can't help but think of the chilling comment from Charlotte, Mary's mother, during her interview with local detectives. She seemed to allude to some past wrongdoing. Yes, her body language and comments suggested a sense of regret and guilt. She mentioned that Mary ran away often, but the nonchalance in her tone just doesn't sit right. It's deeply unsettling. It's clear that Mary's story is far from over, and every new piece of information only adds more layers to this complex case. Exactly. And as we delve deeper into this case, it's increasingly clear that there's much more than meets the eye. So the parents didn't make much of an effort to find Mary. That's baffling to me. What do we make of this? It's beyond comprehension. Charlotte admitted they should have taken steps to look for Mary, but didn't. She even mentioned a police report, which doesn't exist in the records. Their lack of concern is deeply troubling. I can't help but feel a chill down my spine. And the stepfather, William Houle, his account of Mary's disappearance, didn't quite add up, did it? Not at all. When asked about the last time he saw Mary, his explanation was that he noticed her missing during a routine check on the kids. He also mentioned calling the police, contradicting their earlier statement of not reporting her missing. That contradiction is glaring, and his account of the altercation with Mary is chilling. Indeed, he admitted to being angry with Mary for allegedly poisoning his dog. The narrative of him restraining her as she tried to escape is quite disturbing. His recollection of using a martial arts technique, striking her in the upper chest, adds another sinister layer to this case. It's terrifying to think about what could have happened to Mary. This case is getting darker and more complex with every revelation. It certainly is. Each piece of information only deepens the mystery and raises more questions about Mary's disappearance. The story keeps getting darker. William Houle admitting to his extreme anger and going as far as acknowledging a demon inside him that could have killed Mary. That's chilling. What are your thoughts? It's deeply disturbing. The level of anger Houle admitted to is terrifying. It's notable that he described hitting Mary in the throat, yet denies directly killing her. His claim of being possessed by a demon when he struck her is a shocking revelation. What do you make of this so far? It's a nightmare, honestly. The abuse Mary suffered, her own stepfather's admission of his uncontrollable anger and the allusion to a demonic possession. It's not just a crime, it's a tragedy. 
indeed. Now, the authorities believed they had a strong case despite not having a body. But the prosecutor wasn't ready to file charges at the time, and then something unexpected happened. The case took a surprising turn when police in Phoenix, Arizona made a traffic stop, marking the first trace of Mary in over two decades. That's a bolt from the blue. After all the horrors we've heard, there's a chance Mary might still be alive? It seems so. It's a shocking development and yet another twist in this already complex case. The question is, who is the person they found in Phoenix? Is it really Mary? If so, where has she been all these years? So Phoenix Police Department pulls over a pickup truck with stolen plates and finds Mary Day. That's an incredible turn of events, isn't it? It's absolutely astounding. Just as detectives were building a case around Mary's possible murder, she appears out of the blue. Her ID, issued by the state of Arizona, was only three weeks old when she was found, which only adds to the intrigue. That is a suspicious coincidence. What was the reaction back in California? Detective Bertina and his boss, Steve Sircone, were shocked. They'd been investigating what they thought was a murder, and suddenly, the alleged victim turns up alive. They were in disbelief, but the physical evidence seemed to confirm it. After all the peculiarities in this case, it almost feels like a ghost story. I can only imagine their surprise. Indeed, and the story gets even stranger. This woman, claiming to be Mary, told detectives that she'd run away from her mother and stepfather as a teenager. It's a stark contrast to the narrative we've been exploring so far. So the plot thickens. We're looking at a case that's taken radical twists and turns at every stage. It's equal parts perplexing and fascinating. Completely agree. This is one of the most intricate and puzzling cases I've come across. We can only wait and see how it unravels further. So Phoenix Mary is sharing memories of abuse that align with the narrative we've heard, but she doesn't recall anything about the sick dog. What's your take? It's puzzling. Mary's recall of the abuse she suffered, including her head being slammed into a tub and a coffee table, is chillingly similar to the details Houle shared. However, her inability to remember the dog incident raises questions about her identity. And it seems the authorities also had doubts. They began to question whether this woman really was Mary, right? Yes, they had suspicions. There was little record of her existence for the past two decades, and her identification card was brand new. They even started referring to her as Phoenix Mary to distinguish her from the Mary they had been investigating. It seems she also expressed some frustration over her lack of existence in the records. Absolutely. In phone conversations, Mary was clearly frustrated with the situation. She even questioned how they could prove her identity if she hadn't existed until now. Her frustration led to a key decision, a DNA test to prove her relationship to her mother, Charlotte. So the detectives seemed convinced they would disprove her identity through the DNA test. Correct. They were quite certain that the DNA wouldn't match, effectively disproving that Phoenix Mary was the real Mary Day. It's another unexpected twist in this already intricate case. So the DNA test proved that Phoenix Mary was indeed Mary Day. That must have been a shock for the detectives. It was. The results, confirming Phoenix Mary's relation to Charlotte, essentially closed the case. As a result, Sherry Calgaro, Mary's sister, invited her to live with her in North Carolina. But even with the DNA confirmation, doubts about Mary's identity continued to linger, right? Yes, that's correct. Sherry noticed that Mary had adopted an unusual accent, something the detectives had picked up on as well. Additionally, Mary revealed that she'd been going by the name Monica Devereaux. Monica Devereaux? So she was living under an assumed name? Yes, she was. Sherry even found magazines addressed to Monica Devereaux in Mary's possession. To be honest, Emily, I didn't quite catch that. Could you explain that news headline in a different way? Of course. After Phoenix Mary moved in with Sherry, she noticed that Mary had adopted a strange accent and was going by a new name, Monica Devereaux. This added another layer of mystery to Mary's identity, despite the DNA results confirming her relationship with Sherry and Charlotte. And Sherry wasn't the only one with doubts about Phoenix Mary's identity, right? Correct. Sherry's sister Kathy also had strong reservations. She had a gut feeling that Phoenix Mary was not their sister. 
One reason was that Mary didn't remember their shared escape plan involving an inheritance from their birth father. They even had a code word for it, which Mary didn't recall. It's a turn of events that keeps this case as puzzling as ever. We're learning that Kathy and Mary had a code word, Mohawk. What's the significance of this? The sisters used this code word to refer to their shared escape plan, which involved an inheritance from their birth father. It was a crucial part of their childhood narrative that Phoenix Mary didn't remember, which heightened Kathy's doubts about her identity. And things took a strange turn when Phoenix Mary sent a note to Detective Bertina. Can you elaborate on that? Indeed, Phoenix Mary sent an email to Detective Bertina in which she seemed to admit she'd been lying about her identity. This revelation was a game changer and raised even more doubts about Phoenix Mary. But despite these doubts, the case remained closed until 2008. What happened then? Well, Steve Sircone, the then police chief of Seaside, received a call from investigators at the Army base in Fort Ord. Cadaver dogs there had found something near a house previously inhabited by William Houle and his family, and this wasn't the original house Mary had disappeared from. So it's possible that a body may have been moved by the Houle family. It's a possibility. Despite another search, the police came up empty. But the idea that Mary's body could have been moved twice added a new level of complexity to the case. And this led to a new investigation. Yes, despite the case being officially closed, Sir Cohn felt something was amiss. He hired Mark Clark, a retired homicide detective, to review the case. Clark found the evidence pointed towards a possible murder and some missed opportunities for resolution. He even called it the most bizarre case he'd ever encountered. It's a shocking development that adds a new layer of mystery to this already perplexing case. So, retired detective Mark Clark had some serious doubts about the parents, correct? Absolutely. Clark was particularly concerned about William Houle's statement, where he suggested a demonic personality of his might have killed Mary during a blackout. Clark interpreted this as an admission of guilt and there's also the matter of the found shoe, right? Yes, investigators found a girl's canvas sneaker, which Kathy identified as similar to ones they wore, in the backyard of the Hool's home. This was an area where Kathy said they were not allowed to play. The plot thickens with the revelation about soil samples found at the site. Indeed. Experts from the Body Farm, a facility that studies body decomposition, found the soil samples consistent with a body having been buried there. Clark's theory about Phoenix Mary being a secret daughter of Charlotte Houle is quite shocking. Is there any validity to this claim? Clark believes it's a possibility. He discovered circumstantial evidence of Charlotte having previous marriages and possible extramarital affairs that resulted in pregnancies. So his theory is that Phoenix Mary could be a previously unknown sister of the missing Mary. That's quite a twist to this already complex case. What's your take on this? It certainly adds a new layer of complexity to an already tangled web of mysteries. If Clark's theory holds true, it would explain the DNA results as well as the inconsistencies in Phoenix Mary's revelations. This case keeps us on our toes with its continual surprises. So Clark believes that Phoenix Mary was sought out by the Hools to dodge prosecution. How do they explain the change of identity? Clark and Sircone theorized that the Hools might have given Phoenix Mary the identity documents of the missing Mary. This would allow the secret sister to legally assume Mary's identity. What about the motivation for this alleged scheme? Sircone suggests that the driving force was an inheritance. With a crude interest, it was worth around $26,000. Sherry, Mary's sister, apparently assisted in securing her part of this inheritance. Clark's theory also explains Mary's peculiar accent, right? Yes, Phoenix Mary exhibits a strong Southern accent, which both Sherry and Kathy claimed the original Mary never had. Clark had this accent analyzed by experts who confirmed that it would require living in the South during formative years to acquire such an accent. An important point, considering Mary only briefly lived there as a child. And then there's the email Phoenix Mary sent stating she wasn't who she claimed to be. What's your take on this? This email is once again a red flag. It adds more weight to the theory that Phoenix Mary might be an imposter. 
But it's important to remember the advice from Judy Velaz, the acting chief of Seaside Police Department, who warns against shaping the story to fit preconceived notions. This case remains an intriguing mystery, to say the least. Sherry Calgaro, Mary's sister, still had doubts in 2017 about the woman claiming to be her sister. What happened when she visited her? Sherry did visit Phoenix Mary in Missouri, but unfortunately, Mary was suffering from late-stage cancer and couldn't receive any more visitors that day. Despite the visit, Sherry still had her doubts. It seems like new acting chief of the Seaside Police Department, Judy Veloz, has made substantial progress in this case, correct? Yes, Judy Veloz chipped away at the theory that Mary was murdered. Additional tests confirmed a DNA match to both Mary's birth parents, raising doubts about the imposter theory. Veloz also had doubts about the shoe found, saying it seemed too small for a 13-year-old girl. What about Mary's explanation for using different names? <laughs> Mary claimed that when she ran away, she started using the name Monica to avoid being detected by the police and returned home. She also mentioned a woman named Maury, whom she met when she was on her own in California. And who exactly is this Maury? Maury Kimmel took Mary in when she was 15. Mary lived with Maury and her two daughters, and Kimmel described Mary as naive and childlike. It is possible that this period of her life was the most stable and nurturing she ever experienced. However, Mary disappeared after about a year with Kimmel. Judy Velaz discovered that Mary moved around a lot and lived on the margins. How did she describe Mary? Velaz characterized Mary as a survivor. She also solved the mystery of why Mary obtained that Arizona ID. It turns out Mary needed state aid to pay for a gallbladder surgery, which led her to get an official ID. What about Mary's foggy memory and that email she sent claiming she wasn't who she said she was? Velaz attributes Mary's memory gaps to a combination of trauma and her struggle with alcoholism. As for the email, Mary sent a follow-up email confessing her confusion about what she was trying to say in the first email. And the smoking gun in this mystery. Velaz found a photograph courtesy of one of Maury Kimmel's relatives, which showed Mary a year after the alleged murder. This photo served as the definitive evidence to close the case. True Face, a facial recognition company, affirmed that it's the same person in the photograph. That's a startling turn of events. What's your take on this revelation? Indeed it is. This development, along with Velaz's diligent work, appears to resolve the mystery behind Mary Day. It's a stark reminder of how life's hardships can lead to complex and twisting narratives, and it's a testament to the tenacity of law enforcement in seeking the truth, however elusive it may be. Judy Velaz finally closed the Mary Day investigation after all these years. How did she and others react to this conclusion? Velaz's report, backed by the photo evidence, provided a sense of closure for many. Sherry Calgaro, for instance, felt a weight lifted off her shoulders upon accepting that the woman she met was indeed her sister, Mary. But not everyone seems to be at peace with the closure, right? Correct. Mark Clark, despite seeing the report and admitting to second-guessing his investigation, still holds on to his old hunch that Mary might be an imposter. He still believes that William Houle murdered Mary Louise Day. And what about Steve Sircone? Steve Sircone is leaning towards accepting the identity of Mary after reading Judy's report and seeing the photo. He, however, remains confident about one thing. The cadaver dogs were onto something. He's left wondering about who is actually buried in those grave sites. So in the end, the mystery remains somewhat unresolved. You could say that. It's a complex case, and one that's taken many twists and turns. Even as the primary thread seems to have reached a conclusion, there are still few loose ends. The death of Mary Day, nine days after Judy Velaz interviewed her, adds another layer of poignancy to this already intricate investigation. Thank you all for joining us today on Hot Topic and Fresh News. We dove deep into the intriguing Mary Day case, and we appreciate you being part of this journey. If you found our discussion insightful and want to stay updated on current events, don't hesitate to subscribe and activate notifications. Your support is invaluable to us. Share the love by recommending us to your friends and social circles. And if you have thoughts about the case, we'd love to hear them in the comments. And don't forget, we're here for you every day, 
serving up fresh insights on the latest happenings. Be sure to stick around because we've got plenty more intriguing stories on the horizon. Make us a part of your daily routine and I guarantee you won't regret it. We are indeed grateful for your listenership and we're excited to continue bringing you engaging and thought-provoking content. It's a promise that we'll keep the dialogue open, incisive, and real for you. Absolutely. So till we meet again on the next episode, remember, stay in the loop, keep your eyes on the news, our channel's content will amuse.